Okay, um, hello to everyone, both virtually and in person. Today, we're super happy to have Batul Vana Hashemi. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Who's going to be telling us about quasi-local quasi thermodynamics of cosmological horizons. So Batul, take it away. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk at UBC. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the work uh, that I've been doing with my advisor, Ted Jacobson, and also another paper that came out recently with Ted, Andrew Svesko, and Manis Wieser. So a little bit of background. Uh, so shortly after the discovery that black holes have temperature and entropy, Gibbons and Hawking in this uh, very seminal paper uh, found that the, the Sitter static patch also has a temperature and entropy. So the static patch of the sitter uh, is this region of the sitter space here. I'm showing the Penrose diagram of the, the sitter space, which is a solution to the Einstein equation with a positive cosmological constant. And uh, the usual coordinate system for the static patch is this coordinate system that I'm showing here. And Gibbons and Hawking show that the temperature of the sitter space which is the temperature of the radiation that an observer sitting at the center of the patch would uh, detect is proportional to the uh, surface gravity, which in turn is inversely proportional to the sitter length, which is given from the cosmological constant. So each slice of this Penrose diagram is a closed surface. There is no boundary here. So uh, in four dimensions, it will be a three a sphere, for example. Um, so the sitter space has temperature. They also found a first law in the sitter space, uh, which relates the variation of the killing energy of matter fields to the variation of the area of the horizon, cosmological horizon AC. This is again the surface gravity. Um, in another paper in the same year, uh, in the same journal actually, they calculated the entropy of the de Sitter space using the gravitational path integral, the Euclidean path integral that they uh, used for gravity. Their main focus was a uh, grand canonical ensemble with asymptotically flat black holes, but they treated the de Sitter space in a similar way. Namely, they approximated the partition function, the, the, what they call the partition function, uh, with a, a saddle point and then equate this uh, Euclidean action that appeared in the exponent with some thermodynamic potential, W. And then they argued that because the de Sitter space has no boundary, I mean, each time a slice, there is no boundary here. Therefore, there is no conserved charges that one can define. In other words, there is no energy term, no charge, no angular momentum that could appear in this thermodynamic potential. So the only term that appears in this thermodynamic potential would be the entropy term. And then using these uh, relations, they read off the entropy, which uh, interestingly became exactly one fourth of the Sitter horizon area. So this is all good and nice, but the statistical foundations of their calculation has been remained obscure because if there is no boundary, as I showed, uh, how is the ensemble that the Gibbons and Hawking considered was defined? If there is no boundary, how is the temperature specified? If they're saying this is the partition function, so presumably it refers to a canonical ensemble with a given temperature, but there is no boundary. So for the black hole case, we have always the asymptotic boundary or we could always uh, put the black hole in a box and consider finite boundaries on which one can specify the temperature. But how does that work for the Sitter space? So that was one question. The other question was this minus sign in the first law that they found. So it says that if one adds mat killing energy or matter into the static patch, the horizon area shrinks. How does uh, this minus sign is, how is that minus sign interpreted thermodynamically? Um, so 
in the like first two third of my talk, I'm gonna address this question. And in the uh, last third or one fourth of my talk, I would discuss this minus sign. Um, okay, so now um, in order to address all these questions, um, we thought that maybe the starting point should not be the Desider space itself, but we should take a step back and consider uh, a thermodynamic ensemble for a gravitational system. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to introduce a way in which one can define either a canonical or a microcanonical ensemble for a gravitational system. I probably won't have time to discuss microcanonical case, but uh, I will discuss thoroughly the canonical case. So the starting point is not the Desiderius space or any other solution to the Einstein equation. Instead, we are going to start from defining an ensemble by specifying some boundary conditions on a boundary that will be the boundary of our system. Then uh, we will obtain the path integral representation for either the partition function or the density of our states. Uh, and then because we cannot, uh, of course, calculate the path integral exactly in four dimensional gravity, which is the focus of my talk, we should, def we should uh, estimate the path integral. Uh, in the process of estimation, we need to deform the lapse and shift integration contours so that we can access some Euclidean saddles. Um, we are going to reduce to a spherical symmetry. So the, the paths that contribute to the path integral, uh, we only consider the spherically symmetric ones. We are also imposing the constraints. And then by identifying the relevant path, um, we see that for a given canonical ensemble data, we should allow for both black holes and cosmological horizons. After the estimating the path integral, we recognize thermodynamic phases and discuss the stability. Uh, and then in the last part, I derived the first law of the Caesar horizon, uh, again with the system boundary, which we called York boundary because it was York who first introduced a finite boundary in the context of black holes. Uh, in that way, we can interpret the minus sign and see how the first law of a cosmological horizon should be interpreted. Uh, well, we introduce a boundary with a finite size, but then we recover Gibbons and Hawking's result, of course, when the boundary size goes to zero inside the static patch of the series space. If I have extra time, I might uh, comment on uh, obtaining the same results using a Lorentzian path integral without uh, deforming to Euclidean metrics, which is the subject of an upcoming paper with Ted. Um, I should say at the very beginning that uh, we work in four dimensional gravity. So for the system boundary, we choose this uh, standard topology of a two sphere cross S1. The S1 part is gonna be the, uh, the temperature that is fixed at the boundary. Um, and for canonical ensemble, we choose Dirichlet boundary condition at the boundary. But I should say that uh, Dirichlet boundary condition for finite boundaries is a little bit problematic. Namely, the initial boundary value problem is not, uh, might not be well posed. Uh, or if, it's, if it is well posed, the system might not be as stable actually. So uh, there are some papers uh, that cast doubt on the well-posedness and the, the system being a stable point. So, um, but the setups of those papers are different from ours. So we acknowledge this caveat, but we are gonna assume that uh, the system is at least as stable and we can proceed with a finite boundary on which the Richelieu boundary conditions are specified. But in principle, one should check this. Just a question. So, so do you, yes. you're imagining your, your boundary here is something that you're imagining to be at finite distance? Yeah, so we okay. have a finite boundary. Uh, this R is the radius of our spherical boundary, which is a uh, finite number. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, 
for canonical ensemble, the starting point is the partition function, which is going to be taken to be the standard definition for a quantum system, e trace of e to the minus beta h. For the Hamiltonian h, we take the GR Hamiltonian, which is the sum of the constraint uh, terms h mu plus a boundary term that is specified at the system boundary. Then uh, at this point, we wanted to uh, try to at least try to derive the path integral representation for the partition function using the standard tools. So we insert complete sets of states at each time step and then obtain a physical phase space uh, path integral over canonical variables h and pi, which are the intrinsic and extrinsic geometries of each time slice. Uh, but these canonical variables satisfy the GR constraints. And that explains this delta function of the constraints that we put in the path integral. Um, at this point, we obtain this uh, integrand exponential of this guy. And then um, we can use a functional Fourier integral to represent this delta function using some auxiliary fields, lambda mu, um, that will be related to the lapse and shift later. So in the next step, uh, we have a path integral over both canonical variables and this auxiliary field. Uh, and then we can integrate out the momenta and come up with a configuration space path integral. But we notice that, uh, I mean, it's even clear from here that this exponent is, an, is a complex exponent. It, it's, uh, it has both real and imaginary parts. So the essentiary point of the exponent in this path integral uh, would not be purely a real solution or a Euclidean solution. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a purely real solution. It has, it will be shown that it has a pure imaginary lapse and shift. Therefore, in order to access this Euclidean uh, stationary point, I, I'm calling it Euclidean, but it can be a complex if there is a shift vector also. Uh, in order to access this complex uh, stationary point, one has to deform the integration contour of this lambda, which was originally over real access, so that we can. Uh, go through these complex solutions. It's important to note that we are not rotating the integration contour of lambda, but we are just deforming it so that we can pass through the stationary point. We keep the endpoints of the contour fixed uh, to respect the Cauchy integral in the path integral. Uh, but for those uh, configurations that have imaginary lapse and shift, we would obtain the so-called Euclidean action in the exponent. Um, so we, this is the closest that we can get to the standard Euclidean path integral. But we should keep in mind that this partition function that we have started with is not a strictly equivalent to this Euclidean path integral. That's why I'm using these quotation marks here. And in particular, non-Euclidean contributions along the deformed contour, they are essential and they have to contribute in the path integral to maintain this equivalence. And also to impose the constraints because remember the original lambda contour was imposing the constraints here for us. Why is imposing the constraints important? Because uh, as, is, as it is well known, the Euclidean path integral is sick from the conformal mode problem. So, but if one imposes the constraints, it is shown that the conformal mode problem is uh, avoided. For example, these, these papers show that. And that's because fixing, by imposing the constraint, the, the, the conformal modes are fixed, so there will be no uh, kinetic energy term in the action so that so the action won't be bounded below. So the point here is that uh, only for those configurations that are the stationary points of the exponent and the neighboring configuration that we're going to consider 
the exponent becomes the Euclidean action. There are, there are other configurations for which the, act, the exponent will not be the Euclidean action. So we, did, we, we could not derive the Euclidean path integral from this uh, standard definition of the partition function. But uh, for the rest of the <clears throat> talk, I'm going to consider only those configurations that do have imaginary laps and shift. And because we are working with a spherically symmetric grid, we set sh the shift vector to zero. So we are working with configurations that do have imaginary laps functions. So in that way, they are Euclidean uh, configurations that contribute to the path integral. But we should keep in mind that non-Euclidean solutions, non-Euclidean contributions also exist. And the main job is to make sure that the constraints are satisfied. So in effect, we pick paths that are Euclidean and satisfy the constraints and are also spherically symmetric because to, to simplify the analysis. So uh, that's what I was that what I was, I was what I was being uh, explaining. Um, this was the boundary that we were <clears throat> choosing, which is a spherical boundary. And because uh, the boundary is a spherical. We expect that the stationary points of the action are also a spherical. And then our uh, life would be a lot easy because there is a Birkhoff like theorem that says that for a spherically symmetric solutions of the Einstein equation with positive cosmological constant, uh, the solutions are locally isometric to short shield oscillator space time or the Naria solution. Uh, so the boundaries are spherical, the stationary points are expected to be spherical, but we are not limited or restricted to the uh, stationary points. We also uh, want to see what non-stationary points also contribute to the path integral. And for those non-stationary points, we are making the restriction to <clears throat> choose them also spherically symmetric. Um, we are taking these metric ansatz for the configurations that contribute to the path integral. And the value of this function u, which is uh, related to the lapse function at the boundary, determines the inverse temperature of our canonical ensemble. This function r at the boundary determines the boundary size that we pick as our canonical data. Uh, so we take this metric ansatz and then impose the constraints so that uh, the tra trajectories that they pick are physical uh, trajectories that contribute to the path integral. What about the topologies? Um, so, so, so you notice that at this point, we, we are kind of trying to be as general as possible. So we have a path integral. We want to know what configurations uh, contribute to the path integral. So this is about the geometry. Now about the topology, we also restrict to time independent the spatial topology. So we don't allow spatial topologies to change over Euclidean time. Uh, and there is only one boundary, the system boundary that specifies the canonical data. And each constant tau time slice is foliated by two, by two spheres. But at the inner point of that foliation, three possibilities can happen. The inner sphere can collapse to a point. Uh, for, for that case, we have the topology of a ball plus S1. The inner sphere can be antipolarly identified. In that case, we have an RP3 geon. That's what they called it. Uh, or the sphere area at an inner end can remain finite, but then the time circle shrinks. So this is the familiar horizon topology. So these are the topologies that we consider in our path integral. Um, now let's go and actually impose the constraints. So as I was saying, we take this metric ansatz because it's a spherically symmetric, the momentum constraints, the angular part, parts of the momentum constraints um, are automatically satisfied. There is one component mm -hmm. left in the momentum constraint, and then this is the Hamiltonian constraint that we impose on this metric ensemble. Uh, from the momentum constraint, uh, we see that there are two cases. 
uh, if r prime is zero, it means that all two spheres of our slice have the same radius. And from the Hamiltonian constraint, the radius is fixed to this value. L again is the decitter length. This configuration contributes only if we have chosen a special boundary radius for our ensemble, which is equal to this radius. Um, the functions u and v are indetermined, uh, although if there is a horizon, u vanishes at the horizon. Uh, this class of co configurations include the Naria solution, which has two horizons, and its Euclidean topology is S2 cross S2. So this is one option. The other option is that R prime is non-zero, but V dot is zero. Dot means uh, derivative with respect to time. Uh, in that case, if V dot is zero, we can further gauge fix this function V and set it to one. Uh, and then the only, um, indetermined function in our slice, constant time of slice would be this function r as a <clears throat> function of coordinate y, but we do not need to solve for r, r of y analytically in order to obtain the, the action in the path integral. Uh, it suffices to know r prime, which can be obtained from the Hamiltonian constraint. And we find that this is, uh, this has become the familiar function that one sees in the slices of Churchill the Cedar space. This mass parameter is an integration constant and um, plays the role of a free parameter in the configurations that we consider. Again, uh, this function u is indetermined, no surprise, we are just solving the constraints, uh, but vanishes if there is a horizon. And if there is a horizon, uh, we assume that the space time is regular at that horizon. So if there's a horizon at some radius Rh, this regularity condition relates this function, this uh, radius Rh to this mass parameter. Um, let's look at this function f of r as a function of mass. So this mass parameter could be, could be anything from negative values, zero or positive values. But because we want uh, to have Riemannian slices, only uh, the value of f, which is positive is acceptable. So for example, if the mass parameter is this critical value, this shows that the function f has to be zero, which means um, that r prime is zero. So there is uh, just, one radius for all spheres that exist in the slice. Uh, the more interesting case is when uh, the mass value is between zero and this critical value, in which case we this function f has two zeros. And then looking at this equation, this can be interpreted as the energy conservation equation for a particle that moves in one dimension, uh, r being the, uh, the position, and this um, prime is derivative with respect to the parameter y that parameterizes the radial direction of our slice. Uh, so if we have a system boundary at some radius capital R, uh, let's see how, what the slice looks like if we get away from this <clears throat> function, if we get away from this boundary at R. So depending on the value of R prime at the boundary, we could go either to the right or left. Uh, if R prime at the boundary is positive, we go to the right and then we reach the zero of this function F. Uh, this root of the function F corresponds to a turning point. So at this point, we could go back and go to the other zero and so on. So one possibility is that uh, the solution to the constraints also include non-monotonic sphere radius Ri, an embedding diagram of which I'm showing here. Um, so this was the system boundary that I was showing before. If I go to the right, I reach the first root. If I continue, it means that there's a, I, I've passed one, the first turning point and reached the second root. 
at the the smaller uh, root of that function f and actually this uh, slice can go forever uh, at any of these uh, turning points when where our prime is zero again i can have three possibilities the space time can end at one of these uh, zeros if i have a horizon or if I have an RP2 when the two sphere is antipodally identified, or I can have a turning point uh, as the case that I'm showing here. Um, one interesting point is that if I include these non-monotonic sphere uh, radii in the path integral, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have an uh, infinite degeneracy because as it turns out, the value of the action for all the slices that are extended from the system boundary and end at one of the, uh, let's say I have a slice that starts from the system boundary and ends at the first um, waste at the right. Then I evaluate the action for this slice, I get something and then that value of the action is exactly the same as the value of the action if I end if I had ended up at the second waste. So there will be an infinite number of uh, configurations that contribute equally to the path integral. So there is this degeneracy of the path with identical action. Well this is of course alarming because that that uh, could make that the that could make the path integral divergent. Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, but besides that, uh, we're gonna uh, conjecture that only solutions to the constraints that are embeddable in a four-dimensional solution to the Euclidean field equations actually contribute to the path integral. In other words, among all these possibilities, we're gonna keep only the horizon possibility. Uh, and the reason is that Remember these slices that we started with, they belonged to four dimensional Lorentzian space times. And because each slice was uh, satisfying the constraints, by, the, by construction, it was embeddable in a Lorentzian four dimensional space time. Now, these are Euclidean slices uh, that are still satisfy the constraints, but we are conjecturing that the process of analytic continuation that we performed in order to estimate the path integral should still respect the space of solutions. So we only keep the slices that are embeddable in a four-dimensional Euclidean solution. So if I want to uh, find a four-dimensional Euclidean solution, I have to solve all the equations of motion, all, all the Einstein's equation, not just the constraints. And if I do that, it gives me that the function u or the lab function should also vanish at a location when where r prime is zero. Uh, and that result is familiar from the Lorentzian counterpart because these slices are uh, slices of a short shield sitter, uh, so Lorentzian short shield sitter. But if it's a Euclidean case, uh, if the function u is going to vanish at all these uh, turning points, I won't have a smooth Euclidean, four dimensional Euclidean manifold. And because uh, I'm only considering a smooth manifold, I'm going to say that these slices are not embeddable in uh, smooth Euclidean solutions to the Einstein equation. And this embeddability criteria saves me from that degeneracy problem because I'm not, I'm first considering the possibilities that the constraint equations are giving me, but then I'm gonna rule these out because of some, um, because on the grounds of um, this hypothesis that I'm making here. Um, so, I try to be as general as possible when I was asking what, configurations actually contribute to the path integral. And then we saw that some of those configurations are actually ruled out because of some physical arguments. And then now I've come down to the space of all spherically symmetric configurations that satisfy the constraints. 
and uh, respect that embeddability criterion. For those configurations that contribute to the path integral, I can obtain the reduced action, reduced in the sense that it's spherically reduced and it also satisfies the constraint. You see that this action for those uh, configurations takes the form of uh, some uh, inverse temperature beta times the brown York energy of the configuration minus the entropy. Um, as I was saying, the value of R prime at the system boundary can be positive or negative. This sign is not fixed by the canonical ensemble data. So for a given canonical ensemble, for a given temperature and system boundary, I can have both signs. That's why I have plus and minus here. Um, this function, this uh, variable M uh, or horizon size, doesn't matter. This is a free parameter that I have in my action. And I can obtain the stationary points of this action simply by taking the derivative of this action with respect to R, H, or N. And for the stationary points, I have a relation between the value of the horizon and the system boundary uh, radius R and also the temperature. So uh, the horizon radius for stationary points uh, is determined uh, through this relation up to some possible discrete choices. Um, the stationary points that I'm talking about here is only, as I was saying, with respect to a spherical constraint variation because I just varied with respect to RH. Uh, but if I want, I can promote these stationary points to full four-dimensional stationary points by considering uh, also the lapse function in the metric ensembles. You see this action here is independent of the lapse function, which is no surprise because the uh, constraints uh, have been satisfied. Uh, but the following uh, that I'm showing you is, are gonna be the four dimensional solutions that are stationary points with respect to all kinds of variations. Um, the first stationary point that I'm going to show you is the region inside the static patch of a Sitter space. Uh, so the system is here. This is the system boundary. This is a space diagram that I'm showing you. So the system does not include the cosmological horizon. We call this solution thermal De Sitter. Um, this is the analogous of the like hot flat space in the zero cosmological constant uh, case. This solution exists at any temperature, no matter what temperature you choose for your canonical ensemble. Uh, at higher temperatures, the region between the system boundary and the cosmological horizon uh, can also be one of the stationary points. This time, the cosmological horizon at RC is part of the system, but the inside region is not. So inside region can be a black hole or anything. Uh, we don't care about the inside region. That's, uh, we can think of it as actually the reservoir. The reservoir that is setting the temperature fixed at the system boundary lives inside. Um, in principle, we could uh, consider a negative mass configurations because whatever is inside this boundary is outside the system. So an observer would never encounter a naked singularity or anything. Um, the topology of this configuration is the standard disk process too. Uh, if I increase the temperature even higher, I will have small and large black holes. Uh, this is something like the ADS black hole cases when uh, if we increase the temperature, black hole solutions appear. So again, the system is the region between the system boundary at R and the black hole radius at RB. Uh, these also have topology of the disk process too. So now we have these uh, stationary points, but we also have off-shell configurations, the non-stationary points. 
And when we are going to estimate the path integral, uh, we have to check that the action that we choose in order to approximate the path integral has to be the minimum Euclidean action. So we have to check that if we are picking the stationary point as an approximation for the path integral, it has to be a local minimum of the action. There are two main uh, approaches that one can check this. One is uh, something that we've been following, namely we restrict it to a class of a spherically symmetric four geometries that satisfy the constraint. So if we have this configuration space, we look at the subset of a spherically symmetric configurations um, and we identify the stationary points. And we need to uh, check that these stationary points are actually local minimum in this subset. Um, well, of course, when there is a stationary point that has to be the minimum, that minimum also needs to be the minimum in the whole neighborhood, not just within the class of a spherically symmetric uh, configurations. Uh, this analysis of checking that whether the stationary point is actually a minimum uh, has been done numerically in various places. Um, the usual uh, way for examining that is that one uh, expands the uh, geometry around the stationary point and searches for negative modes. Um, the interesting point is that all the negative point modes that uh, people have found uh, are very within the spherically symmetric section. So that gives us confidence that if we just follow the first path, by first restricting to a spherically symmetric cases, uh, we will not miss any uh, negative modes or uh, instability in that case. So we're not following the numerical method, but because past experience showed that the negative modes are actually within the spherically symmetric configurations, um, we, we should be able to find any meaningful instability that might happen in our case as well. So let's go back to the action and um, plot that in terms of the free parameter horizon radius RH. Um, so for this plot, we have chosen a system boundary R, um, which is some value, and we have plotted different um, temperature graphs. So for example, for a given temperature, let's say curve B, we have both minus and plus sign. Uh, the plus sign corresponds to the cosmological branch. The minus sign corresponds to the black hole branch and both coexist in one ensemble, as I said before. Uh, this value R hat is a function of capital R, which is the other root of F, that function F when the other root is R. Um, as I was saying, on the cosmological branch, we could allow for negative mass solutions as well, uh, or equivalently when the horizon size exceeds the decider length L. Uh, and these uh, dashed parts in these graphs um, are showing the negative mass part. Um, but there could be arguments uh, based on which one uh, actually um, discard the negative mass configurations because if we don't um, then we cannot realize the system plus reservoir as some uh, combination of a we cannot re realize them as a combination of a physical setup so if we actually care about what is behind the system boundary in the cosmological case we should actually discard the negative mass case and if we don't discard this, we see that the action will become unbounded below actually. Um, so as I was saying, we have these two branches for any given temperature. Now the question is, um, in order to identify the dominant configuration, should we allow transitions between these two, these two branches or not? Because, um, as you see, these branches are not connected to each other in the phase space. 
And if there is no uh, connected path between two configurations, uh, is it plausible to consider like quantum tunneling between them or um, one shouldn't consider transitions between these two branches? Um, within the spherically symmetric configurations, there is no connected path. But one could argue that if one allows uh, for non-spherically symmetric configurations, maybe there is a connected path. Or if one allows for more exotic, complex geometries, maybe there is a connected path. So uh, because we have not explored those areas, we uh, are showing the phase diagrams for uh, both cases. In, what, in one scenario, we do not allow transitions and we just obtain the phase space uh, temperature versus system boundary for each branch separately. So this is for the black hole and thermal de branch. And this is for the cosmological horizon phases. Uh, but if we do allow uh, transitions between, uh, <clears throat> between uh, configurations, we have to uh, come up with a, another phase space. Uh, which combines everything together. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about the stability. The more interesting one is the high temperatures uh, case. So if I look at one of those graph, one of those curves in the action plot, so for example, if the temperature is high enough, um, I will have uh, these off-shell configurations that contribute to the path integral and also these are stationary points. Um, so we see that within uh, the, the family of the stationary points, so we have four stationary points, the cosmological horizon stationary point is the solution with the lowest action. But this is the ma local maximum of the Euclidean action, not the local minimum. So this cannot give a good approximation for the path integral of the partition function. And there is an instability um, that runs the system towards the end point. So actually this end point is the configuration that dominates the path integral um, if, we if we exclude the negative mass configurations. Um, so this is the lesson that we learned here that focusing on the stationary points is not enough. Maybe there are endpoints in the configuration space that are actually dominating over the stationary points. Um, I can explain a little bit about the nature of this endpoint. Uh, this has a horizon uh, radius of uh, the sitter length L. And if this was on a stationary point, it would have had a lower temperature than the reservoir. So uh, this is a Euclidean analysis that just points to an instability channel. And if we are in, uh, considering a physical process of what actually is going on, if one puts a cosmological horizon system next to a reservoir with a certain temperature, the following could happen. So if the cosmological horizon absorbs some radiation from the uh, reservoir, uh, instead of heating up, it cools down. So it absorbs more and more radiation so that almost all the energy of the reservoir has been, is transferred to the system. But um, if the reservoir is losing its content, its mass or its energy, it cannot act as a perfect reservoir that maintains the temperature. So eventually the combination of the system and reservoir will settle down to a nearly empty deciter space, which is represented by this endpoint here. Um, so now I'm gonna go to the first law of the deciter space. Um, as I was saying, there is this mysterious, or at least it was uh, not very well interpreted in our view, this minus sign here. Um, there has been a few interpretations of this minus sign in the past literature. Um, 
one interpretation was that maybe the entropy actually refers to the outside region. This was argued uh, by Gibbons and Hawking themselves and other people. Uh, well, this interpretation is kind of inconsistent with the inter thermodynamic notion of the entropy of a system that is accessible to the observer. And also, uh, if the global state on the, the slice of the sitter space is a pure state, the entropy of the inside the static path should be equal to the entropy of the outside. So we did not know how to make up or what to make of this argument. Another interpretation of the minus sign was that maybe actually the temperature of the deciter static patch is negative. This was supported by the idea that the uh, energy or the Hamiltonian in the deciter space is bounded above because there is a maximum mass for any black hole that you could put in the deciter space. And also uh, the the Hilbert space of the Decider space was argued to be finite dimensional. So maybe this idea of negative te temperature could actually work. Um, the main problem with this uh, interpretation is that when the killing temperature of the quantum fields are, is obtained, it is actually a positive temperature, namely the, the temperature that Gibbons and Hawking found for the thermal radiation that is this that is uh, detected by an observer uh, in the static patch of the sitter space. So that temperature is positive. Um, another um, uh, point that makes this negative temperature interpretation less plausible was that we actually uh, uh, try to define a canonical or a microcanonical ensemble in the way that I was talking about by introducing a boundary for a negative temperature uh, gravitational system. And that result uh, did not yield to a negative, uh, to a mm, well-defined negative temperature canonical ensemble. It led to negative entropy. So it was uh, pointing out to some difficulties and something definitely was going on uh, wrongly in that analysis. So since we were not satisfied with the interpretations of the minus sign, we said, well, okay, uh, maybe this minus sign can again be understood if we start with a system boundary on which the uh, canonical or microcanonical data is uh, specified. So in order to do that, we introduce a system boundary inside the static patch and uh, considers the, <clears throat> consider the slice that extends from the system boundary to the horizon. On this slice, um, we can obtain a, uh, something similar to the first law, for example, using uh, the covariant phase space formalism that relates uh, three quantities together. The first term is variation of the Brown-York energy uh, that is defined at the system boundary. This is the variation of the Keeling energy, the same thing that was appearing in Gibbons and Hawking's first law. And this is the uh, variation of this horizon area. So the first law that we obtain by introducing the system boundary has this extra term, variation of the Brown-York energy. And our interpretation is that in order to think about the internal energy of the system, it cannot be the killing energy of these matter fields that plays the role of that internal energy. Instead, it has to be the Brown-York energy of the system that should be interpreted as the uh, internal energy of the system. So if one wants to write a, write a Clausius relation like DE equals TDS, that E has to be the Brown-York energy. And once we consider this Brown-York energy as the internal energy of the system, uh, the temperature that appears on the other side is positive. Um, we can of course take the limit as R goes to zero. And in that case, um, we, have zero Brown-York energy and its variation is also zero. 
so that we recover the Gibbons and Hawking first law. Um, and if we have some thermalized matter, we could trade off this variation of the matter energy with um, variation of the entropy of the matter fields. And then this first law that we obtained can be thought of as a, a law that relates the variation of the internal energy to the variation of the generalized entropy of the system. Um, okay, I, I guess. Can I ask a question, please? So, sure. Uh, wait, in taking this limit as r goes to zero, does t remain positive uh, throughout? Pause, sorry, can you Does the temperature T remain positive as you take that one? Yes, 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 it does. Yeah, so this is the, this is the, so before taking the limit as R goes to zero, this temperature that appears here uh, is the uh, red shifted Gibbons and Hawking temperature. Um, so it's it's the temperature that I showed at the beginning of my talk, but redshifted by the redshift factor at this uh, system boundary. Uh, when R goes to zero, uh, the temperature at the center of the static patch becomes exactly the Gibbons Hawking temperature, uh, one over two pi L uh, with positive sign. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, so we can obtain the Decider temperature and entropy in the zero R limit, but the question remains as to what is the interpretation of the partition function that Gibbons and Hawking used for the Decider space? Uh, in order to answer that question, we consider um, the region between the system boundary and the horizon. And the topology of that region would be a forest sphere from which a, uh, a, a region of topology S2 cross S1 is removed. In order to better visualize that, let's lower one dimension and consider a three a sphere. Um, this dashed line is playing the role of the horizon. So this is a three a sphere that I'm showing on the plane. Uh, and each point at this boundary um, is identified. So this is a plane when the, the point at the infinity is identified. So this is a three sphere. And then this dashed line is the horizon. The system boundary is uh, this circle with radius R. This is the time circle that goes around the horizon and the horizon is the fixed point of the time translation. Uh, operator. Um, each time a slice, this is a dark, this darker gray, is a two hemisphere in this one lower uh, dimensional case. And uh, if we shrink the system boundary to zero, the only condition that we put on the configuration that contribute to the path integral is that they should have a time circle of a thermal time circle of length beta. So the path integral would be over all geometries that have a thermal time circle of length beta. But this is nearly a condition. This is nearly a restriction. You can always find a thermal time circle with, within all um, geometries that uh, have this topology of S4. So in this way, uh, we can interpret the gibbons hawking path integral to be the integral over all geometries on the four sphere. Uh, in four dimensional case, uh, the four dimensional Decider space is, this, is, the known, is the only known stationary point. Um, and that has the lowest action. Uh, the temperature, because there is no uh, connection left to the system boundary because we have, uh, sh we have shrunk in the system boundary to zero size. The temperature is determined by the saddle point or the stationary point, which is at the Citer space. But uh, the point is that in this limit, when the system boundary shrinks to zero, the Hamiltonian vanishes. So looking at the partition function, 
uh, when the Hamiltonian vanishes, the partition function is computing trace of the identity operator, which gives us the dimension of the Hilbert space of all the states that are surrounded by the horizon. Uh, I guess I don't have any time left to talk about the Lorentzian case. Um, oh, what happened? Cannot proceed. Um, sorry, let me stop and start share again. Um, what? Not working? Uh, I guess my PDF reader is not working for some reason. Mm. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me go to my PowerPoint slides. But anyway, um, I was almost done. Um, uh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm out of time now, so I should probably stop here and leave you with my takeaway messages slide. slide. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matul, for your very nice talk. Uh, do you have any additional questions for her? I, I guess I was wondering if, do, do you think there's some sort of toy model, like instead of working in higher dimensions and and limiting to the geometries that you consider, would it would it be interesting to look at some lower dimensional toy model? Would, would that help um, answer some of these questions? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, actually, um when we were uh, thinking about the meaning of the minus sign and whether it can be understood as a negative temperature uh, case, uh, we were thinking that maybe this question can be answered in a lower dimensional toy model perhaps, but we haven't explored that yet. So it's possible, but I don't know. Okay, uh, if we have no further questions, let's thank Matu again. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. <laughs>